It was about two years ago I got to meet the man I'm about to ask to come on stage with me here. And I was immediately struck by his extraordinary past, excuse me, father's heart. Father's heart. And he said, son, you need to go to this website and listen to my testimony. And it was like two and a half hours long. <laughs> Is that right, Pastor Rex? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to speak hyperbolically. <laughs> I listened to it. And where this man has come from and what this man has come through is deserving of honor all itself. But what this has formed in this man is worthy of double honor. And it's my incredible pleasure to be able to invite Pastor Rex onto the stage. Thank you, sir. Oh my goodness. So today, we get to do a couple of things. Amen. Because Hallelujah. on Friday, I went into Rex's world. And I got to witness the ministry that flows through this man when he's in the wild. When he's in prison in the wild. Hallelujah. Right? This is his ministry that he's been running for how many years, Pastor Rex? If just off the top of my head, I would say I've been involved in prison ministry for as long as I've been born again. And this August, that'll be 46 years. Wow. We got to spend all day on Rikers Island together, locked in ministry and in an extraordinary, fruitful environment. The news calls it dangerous, the news calls it violent, the news calls it hell on earth, and I'm sure it's all of those things, but we also got to see heaven on earth on Friday. Amen. And I've also got a shout out to every man that's involved with Pastor Rex, the men and women that have been learning from him, growing with him, uh, who are in there with us. Ulysses, bro. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. Baker Hallelujah. and Adrian and Hallelujah. Anthony. Uh, and JP and anybody else that is here today, these men have walked through fire and have come out with no smell of smoke. Come on. And it's because of the finished work of Jesus Christ and discipleship and them grabbing onto the promises of God and believing the promises of God more than the present circumstances of their life. And I honor these men who have walked through hell and come out smelling like heaven. They are beautiful, and God has worked an incredible work in their life and through the ministry of Pastor Rex. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you, Lord. What, what else did we do in there on Friday, Pastor Rex? What, there was so much, but maybe if we could just sum it up in a yeah, few minutes here. So many things were happening. Um, as my church family, you've all been praying for quite some time, and I want you to please understand this. When you join yourself in prayer with somebody, what you're doing is, what they're doing becomes part of your eternal legacy. So everything God may use me on the front to accomplish, or, or, or Pastor Nathan, or, or people around me to actually do the work, without your prayers, nothing substantial and eternal is going to happen. Listen to this. What we do is not the work. Prayer is the work. Come on, I could say an amen to that. Yes, sir. So, so we, on, on Friday, this was, this called, this was a, the beginning of what I've been praying for for decades and decades. And so many others even before me were praying for that we would take back the crown jewel in the enemy's diadem. And we started that on, on, on Friday. Uh, 60 women were in one of the prisons after I shared some, some stories about our Jesus, took an altar call, 58 made a decision to come to Jesus. Yes. Correction officers came to Jesus. I mean, God was moving in every place all simultaneously because that's what our God does, right? 
So it was very exciting to be the recipient of your prayers, church. And I look forward to more of your prayers and more of the uh, authority of God being released as we take Rikers Island and the, the jail system on the, on the city level, state level, and federal level, and we're gonna rip it out of Satan's hands. He's ripped off, us off long enough, amen? So now he's gonna experience what it's like to get ripped off the same way when Jesus rose from the dead, he ripped the keys of death out of Satan's hand. He's about to experience that again, amen. 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 This is incredible to go into that into, into Rikers Island to see the favor that God has graced Pastor Rex with. Doors opening, opening, opening. Um, you normally can't drive your car onto the island. We drove multiple cars onto the island. You can't get food onto the island. I ate chicken parmesan on the island. <laughs> and it was because of the favor and the hard work and the prayers of this man and the community around him. So thank you, church, for partnering thank with, you, church. with us as we do you this. Give yourself a hand, please. Come on. Who can do better than that? You're, I it's mean, good come news. on. It's good news. Hallelujah. Yeah. So today is Father's Day, and you're on this stage because of your father's heart today. I love you. I you're love an you. awesome man of God. So are you. And, um, you know, church, as we go through life and build something for ourselves personally, home, family, career. I believe it's each of our hope that we would build something that outlives us, that's significant beyond just our personal life. And I'm gonna start asking Pastor Rex here, some questions around how we can build and what has built this man. What has built this ministry? What's the backstory here? What legacy does this come out of? This week I was very sharply reminded of how God builds. And yesterday I, I got a text and a call that my grandmother, who served the Lord for the last, I don't know how long, 40 years or so, God to be with her maker, God to be with Jesus. It's about a year ago, no, it was during 2020, I sat down with her and asked her questions for two hours on a recording. And I got all of her life story and I heard the miracles. You're saying God is running after you. And one day I'll share more in detail, but she didn't know God at all. And a woman that had only heard her name started praying for her. She started praying for Jeannie. And God led this woman through the woods in her car late one night to my grandmother's front door. God led her. Didn't know her address. All she knew was her name. She knocked on her door. I said, Jeannie, I've been praying for you. And she led her to Jesus. God is running after us. Sometimes he's running after us very overtly and openly. Sometimes it's obscured through pain and hardship. But if we can receive what God is giving us and work with our Father who's in heaven and honor the situations that God brings into our life, I believe that we can build something. So Father God, I pray that you'd speak to us and use this limited time that we have here together we open our hearts to what you would like to speak to us through stories and scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pastor Rex, God has built so much in your life. And we might assume it's because you come from an extraordinary spiritual legacy. <laughs> what a great intro. <laughs> but would you please tell us about your dad, where you are from? So... We know that Pastor Nathan knows my story, um, and it couldn't be anything but the antithesis of a wonderful, normal, whatever that looks like, relationship between a father and a son. Um, I'm a New Yorker, originally a New Yorker. When I tell people that, I usually start to twitch a little bit, but I'm originally a New Yorker, born in New York in 1951. Uh, I'll be 71 next month. Oh, Hallelujah. 
My beautiful wife, who's sitting in the front, and I will be celebrating 31 years of marriage this, this month. And by the grace of God, in August, I'll be celebrating 46 years of walking with our Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Come yeah. Come on. So uh, I'm going to kind of move quickly through my story and, and, and emphasize the points of fatherhood and fatherlessness because today is Father's Day. And we're looking towards God today as our sovereign creator, but also as Abba, which in, in the Hebrew means daddy, papa. And Jesus cried out in Romans to his father, Abba, God. He was crying out to Abba because he knew that Abba, daddy, was the only one who could keep him from falling into sin, the only one who could keep him walking in intimacy with Abba, the only one who could keep him from the things of this world and the temptations that we all experience and the pain that we all experience. Abba was Jesus's keeper, as Jesus is our keeper, who wants to reveal today in every heart a new dimension of God as our Abba, Papa. And so jumping right into my story, um, my father was a, a very well-known actor. He was potentially, possibly, the most famous commercial actor in America. Um, if Flo from Progressive Assurance, Insurance walked in the room, everyone would go, yo, Flo! Well then, if you saw my father, you would have gone, yo, Juan Valdez! Colombian coffee commercials. Whoa, under the shade of the tall guamas tree, Juan Valdez picks his beans while they ripen to perfection. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. In school, they used to call me the bean. I mean, the things we have to put up with. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. And so <clears throat> my father was in his own world of oppression of pride, of arrogance, and he was cheating on my mother from their honeymoon forward. Mm. There was no sense of normalcy. There was nothing but yelling and beatings and just such dysfunction, I think, potentially, that because I'm as old as I am, I'm not sure if the word dysfunction was actually in the Bible yet or in the, in the dictionary. It was wow. certainly in the Bible. And, and, and so I, I think somebody must have followed us around and said, we need to give this, this relationship a name. This is dysfunctional. And so we were just so broken that there were almost no words for it. And then finally, at age 12, my father got a great idea to start getting me high on cocaine. Unbelievable, right? But it's true. And so... After that, things continued to spiral down. It was the law of entropy, just spiraling down and spiraling down. And, <clears throat> and my father divorced my mother after my beautiful sister, Melissa, had just been born. And, and I was 14 years old. And, and my mother remarried instantly, my second father, my second disaster story. Wow. Um, Arthur Stein, who was the publisher of McCall's Magazine, the, the largest women's circulated magazine in the world. And, and he was an alcoholic atheist Jew. And Arthur came up to me one day and said, Rex, I hate you. I wish you would die. And, and I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? Why do you do that? Because you look like your father and I wish he would die. And I could hear the, the, the demoniac sound and tone in his voice and, and you could imagine to a 14-year-old boy, it just made my head explode and my heart crush. Mm. Onward Christian my soldiers, goodness. amen? <laughs> so at 16, he threw me out of the house. And I went from money to nothing. I went from a house in Greenwich, Connecticut to a one-room hotel room in Stamford, Connecticut filled with roaches and just started getting migraine headaches and, 
and, and, and just all sorts of tension and fear. And, and the enemy was gripping me and filling me so that he could manipulate my life. Because sometimes intensified pain will open up a door for the enemy to come in. But God, like a flood, loved ones, the flood is not the enemy, will raise up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Anybody wants to shout me down, please do it. Hallelujah. Right. That's good. Come on. And so, so as things continue to progress, uh, at 18, I went to college, got thrown out of college, and I got this bright idea as I went to California that, that my father and I should become drug dealing partners. He came out and we started dealing cocaine, marijuana, all sorts of drugs. Until one day, I was in a drug deal and somebody came in and tried to rip me off and it culminated in a shootout between that person and I through the hills of Beverly Hills. And then I was coming back to my, my house after that shootout with, 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 with blood soaked down my face and, and God spoke to me. He said, next time, if you don't get out now, Rex, you're dead. Yeah. And I was so foolish up to that point because I didn't even realize what, what danger I was in all these years. But, but all of a sudden, God got my attention. How many know that when it's your time to hear the voice of God, he's going to speak? Amen? Amen. That's right. That's right. But we always have a choice as to what we do with what he says to us when he speaks. He will never rob us of our own will, free will, to choose. And so I, I called my father the next day. I said, Dad, no more drugs, no more dealing. He laughed at me. Now I look back, it was, there were demons laughing at me. And so, because he was possessed as well. And, 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 and then from there, things continued to start evolving instead of that de-evolution. Because God was already integrating himself into my life. And so, from there, it was, it was so exciting because I was in my bank one day and this young lady said, do you know Jesus? And I thought, the only Jesus I know is a guy named Jesus I used to buy drugs from. It's probably not that one, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's not who she's talking about. And so I said, no, I don't think I know the Jesus you're talking about. She said, well, would you come to a meeting and, 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 and can, that you might be introduced to the Son of God who died for you and he can redeem you from every negative curse in your life? Wow. Boop. That sounded good to me. Before I went to this meeting that week, I was in another environment where I had a drug overdose. And it left me with so much brain damage, I couldn't put two sentences together contiguously without losing my train of thought. And so I, 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 I didn't go that week to the meeting, but she had given me her number and I, I, I called it. And about a month later, I went to a meeting with her. And when I went to that meeting, something extraordinary. Well, you need, wow, we needed that. My goodness. This is, do you see what's happening here? Where did this man come from? God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. We'll get to this extraordinary thing that happened in a moment. But I want to contrast what Pastor Rex is setting up with what is happening in our culture. I read an article a couple of months ago in the Atlantic around how estrangement between fathers, mothers, and their children is on a sharp increase. And how everything that children are expecting today is affirmation and encouragement, understanding and acceptance, no matter what it is. And it sounds like as a generation, we've exchanged our expectations from as a parent, we've cashed that in and said, can I just have a cheerleader, please? And we've built our expectations up so great 
that when our parents fail us, we would rather cash out than press in and press through. And I know from the way that this story ends, Pastor Rex doesn't run away, but he presses in and presses through because he meets a new father, right? If we're gonna build something as a culture, as a people of God, we cannot quit on the Amen. relationships that God is putting in our heart, in our, in our lives. We can't quit. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what we're doing in the church today is we are now the people of Abraham, 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 yeah. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Because we keep reinventing the wheel and not listening to our fathers. I'm gonna come after younger people who want cheerleaders. We need fathers. Pastor Kaz mentioned on the stage that there, Paul says in Paul's day, there were few fathers. It takes children to be fathers. And on one hand, it's cheap to make children. It's expensive to stay with children. Amen. But it has to be a two-way relationship where we're ready to receive correction as children. Encouragement, yes, but also correction. Also boundary lines. I've heard so many pastors' kids and other kids raised in the church who are angry at their, quote, conservative parents for raising them without alcohol, for raising them without television, for raising them in a maybe a homeschooled environment or an environment that they now deem oppressive because they didn't get to express their full measure of themselves. Well, that full measure of ourself is often called sin, and now we're cursing our parents for raising us right. And now Amen. we're receiving a double yeah. curse because we've thrown off our parents and cursed our parents and not received the love of a corrective loving parent who is by far not perfect, but that's okay if we could press through. Here's a man that was raised not in a conservative home, not in a Christian home, but in an abusive, actually oppressive home. Pastor Rex, what happened next? Thank you. How did you press through that? And how did you become from a drug overdose teenager to a man of God and a father, what did you have to go through? If there's a, a verse in scripture that would define my journey, it would be Romans 4, 17, where the apostle Paul is talking to the church in Rome and he's using the illustration of, of Abraham's life and Sarah's life and how they believed God for this child, even though they, they were too advanced in years to have a child. And it says they believed in hope against hope because they knew God was faithful. Even when they were faithless, God would not deny himself. And that scripture, Romans 4, 17, goes on to say that, that, that God calls things into being from things that don't exist. So regardless of how broken we might be, regardless of how needy we might be, regardless how desperate we might be, we might have voices saying to us, you'll never be able to change, you've gone too far. There's no saving you now. Things are never so restricted by circumstances, loved ones, that they will ever disallow the power of God from breaking into every situation in your life. That's the God we serve. And there was so much brain damage after that drug overdose that I went to a, a psychiatrist and he said, son, do you carry a wallet? And I always carried a wallet and I, I took it out. He said, son, write down your address, put it in your wallet because you're going to forget where you live. Oh my goodness. And, and, and maybe you'll have the presence of mind to look through your wallet, you'll see the address and that might act as a trigger for you to remember your address. I remember as he was saying that to me, I thought, boy, I am way beyond any help or redemption at all. Man. I, had, I had called my father, as I said earlier, and said, no more drugs, no more dealing. And, and I continued, I, I finally went to that church service after a month with Pamela. And, 
And not that week, but the following week I came back and I said, Jesus, if you rose from the dead, I am dead. And if you rose from the dead, rise me from the wow. grave. Yes, God. Yes. If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit that indwells you. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly what Jesus did. I, I gave my heart to Christ and I, 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 got to, I got somebody mentoring me. Everybody needs a mentor in every area of your life. You need to find somebody who's walking in a more intimate place with Jesus. And you need to pray that they will mentor you. And you need to surrender to the example that they're setting for you. As long as they follow the word of God, you might be able to follow them. But if they step outside of the word, you run like your life depends on it. Because it does. I found a great mentor and she started teaching me the word and it took me six months to memorize my first scripture. But I didn't quit. After I was born again, the only thing I wanted from my father was for him to say to me how sorry he was for messing up my life. <laughs> One day I was in prayer and the Holy Spirit, and I, I was saying, oh, you know, you know how we pray these prayers? Oh, Jesus, I wanna be just like you. And the Holy Spirit said, I'll answer that. I want you to forgive your father. I said, Satan, get behind me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the Lord said, you are too much, boy. Um, I, and I said, but you know, God, I, it's impossible for, that, for me to do that. And the Lord, Holy Spirit impressed this on my heart. <laughs> I heard him say, it is impossible, but nothing is impossible with me. I will give you the same love and forgiveness I have shown you for him. I want you to start praying about it and asking every day in Jesus' name that he would send a fresh measure of, the, of, 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 of my presence, of the Holy Spirit to, to, to speak to your heart. And I realized Luke eleven thirteen was coming alive in my, in my life as I look back on that, which says if our earthly fathers who were wicked, knew how to give us good gifts. I mean, I'm sure some fathers did, even mine, somewhere along the line. How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you would but humble yourself and ask? And that verb means keep asking. It's a daily humbling and asking. So every day I would come out in my living room about 5.30 in the morning when I'm praying and seeking God and reading the word, and I would ask the Holy Spirit to fill me with that sense of, of his love and forgiveness uh, that he had shown me that I could move that towards my father. And about a year later, I'm in prayer one day, and the Holy Spirit says, it's done. I didn't feel any different, but I thought, let me test the waters. My father was in California. I was in New York. Wow. I called up my father and have you ever had anybody in life that you, anybody in your life that you speak to them for two seconds and they make you nuts? <laughs> Family can make you nuts like nobody else. And when he would talk to me, he would just be demeaning and he would just whatever. And in two minutes I'd be inflamed. And so I called him up and he started and, and nothing was happening in my heart. I said, wow. And, and, and because I wasn't re reacting, his tone started to change. And in that moment, he was starting to be delivered. When we forgive others who have persecuted us, used us, and abused us, we weaponize the Beatitudes. We weaponize the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. And because and, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Forgive those who have persecuted you, abused you, broken your heart, crushed your spirit. Forgive them, and, and, and you will identify with the exact way your heavenly Father has forgiven you, and you will release the power of my love in your life to move through your life to that person and to those other circumstances. Amen? So that's exactly what happened. He started to get delivered, and, and, 
and I went to visit him in California, and, and I had given up my desire for him to say how sorry he was for hurting me, and, and he came up to me and he said, he said, son, would you please forgive me because nobody could have forgiven me and loved me the way you're now loving me unless they had found the real Jesus, the real God. How do I get him in my life? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Obedience to the word of God and the heart of God and the love of God will always release the fruit of God's character and the fragrant aroma of God's presence everywhere we go. He's faithful to his word. He always watches over it to perform it. So we just want to align ourselves, right, Pastor Nathan, with the word. Absolutely. So, so he was born again. We wept in each other's arms. He got water baptized, spirit filled, and then three years later, he died. Hallelujah. He's in heaven, dancing on streets of gold. Praise God, right? And so... I continued to, to grow and, 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 and met my beautiful wife and, 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 and my wife's dad, I wasn't, I wasn't the ideal man for him. Enter the third challenging father. And he decided not to come to our wedding. And so I was left with another opportunity to, to, to administer the same love that Jesus had shown me because he had been building line upon line, stone upon stone, precept upon precept in my life. And now I was ready for this. I knew where to go. I ran to Jesus with it. Wow. And I said, God, we're going to yes, love God. him the way you love me. Yes, and we're going to forgive him the way you forgive me. And we're going to see a miracle. And today, Luther calls me his pastor. Wow.